Hello and welcome to Food for the Journey, a weekly program of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, Aberdeen, Maryland. My name is Pastor Robert Blessed and I'm glad you could join us for this time of devotion. Today is the 7th of July, 2022, and we are going to be um, completing our Food for the Journey program for the summer. I hope to take it up again in September, but I'm going to take a break for the summer and rethink and retool. And with that in mind, I invite your feedback on what have you liked about this program? What have you not liked about the program? What have I done well? What haven't I done so well? Um, what topics would you like to see explored in future Food for the Journeys um, programs? Let me know. And I look forward to crafting a new and improved Food for the Journey in September. Today we're going to be looking at, uh, or completing our look at the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, as we've said, are just a few verses of the Bible that are recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20, but they have been the foundation of much moral thinking and some um, legal codes and civilizations for 3,000 years. They're certainly worth taking a look at. I'm going to read from the Exodus version of the Ninth and Tenth Commandments first. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now Deuteronomy phrases things a little bit differently, beginning with, um, the commandment, thou shall not steal, verse 17 in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, or you shall not murder. The successive ones say, neither shall you. So it says, verse 17, you shall not murder. Verse 18, neither shall you commit adultery. Verse 19, neither shall you steal. And so on. Verse 21 says, Neither shall you covet your neighbor's wife. Neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I'm going to put this down for a minute. Notice that um, they're essentially the same except the book of Exodus, the Exodus version, says starts off with you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife. So it goes house number one, wife number two. Deuteronomy swaps that and says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife as number one, and number two is you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Then the rest follow with male and female slaves plus you know oxes and animals and things like that. So it's interesting, we'll explore that in just a minute. Um, let's take a look at this commandment. As we know, all of the Ten Commandments relate in some way to those two overall commandments that Jesus gave us, which is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength, essentially all we got, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we can certainly see that in this um, commandment, we have great instruction on how to love our neighbors as ourselves by not coveting their house and their spouse and all their stuff. Um, but let's take a look at, first of all, what does that word covet mean? Covet is um, not a very common word. It's tough to kind of drop covet into normal everyday conversation. You don't really hear it coming up that much. Um, what does it mean? Well. Uh, most definitions that I've been able to look at talked about an inordinate desire, almost an obsession, a compulsion, a, 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 a all-consuming desire for something. Um, it goes against just ordinary want. It's something that just consumes you. We, we, it makes us crazy if we don't have it. And that's the difference between coveting and wanting, although they're, you know, where does, what's the fine line between them? It's something that we all have to think about, aren't they? Don't we? So, what's fascinating about this commandment 
is that it doesn't talk about outwardly things that we do or say, like, you shall not lie. Well, that has to do with my, my speech and my actions. And do not steal. Well, that has to do with um, my exterior, my outward, you know, um, grabbing something that doesn't belong to me. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Well, this one, um, and, and although there are certainly um, character and heart associations with each of those, this one here goes directly to the heart. That you shall not want. And that's a real tough thing to do. And, you know, one rabbi whose commentary I read said, this is the hardest of all the commandments because how are we supposed to reign and have control over our desires? How do we do that? So it's the hardest, but it's something that we certainly need to consider and bring into our lives. It reminds me of Jesus' teaching in the fifth chapter of Matthew where he talked about the commandments, but he brought them into the heart. He said, you have heard it said you do not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you look at somebody with a lustful eye, you have already committed adultery in your heart. And you've heard it said, do not commit murder, but I tell you, if you're angry with someone, and if you call them a, a jerk or an idiot, you've already committed murder in your own heart. So what is it in the heart that goes awry when we covet? Well, what it means is, we want to take into our own life something that rightfully doesn't belong to us. And so what thoughts might arise from that? Well, it might be the machinations of gaining something through illicit means. It might be you know, through the court systems or by lying or, or by uh, trickery or by deception um, or other means. When we talk about coveting our neighbor's wife, probably the, the greatest example in the Bible is David. David who had all the, all the blessings of God and everything else, but he fell in love with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was his object of desire. It was his object of covetedness. But she was married to Uriah, who was one of the honorable soldiers in David's army. But David wanted Bathsheba more than he wanted to honor his friend and his soldier, Uriah. So what David did is he conspired, he sent Uriah off to a battle, a battle that David knew would be unsuccessful for Moriah. He essentially sent Moriah, I'm sorry, Uriah, not Moriah. He sent Uriah off to his death in order that David could then swoop in and marry Bathsheba. It was a sin. He coveted her. Now, it's one thing to, it would have been one thing for him to say, well, Bathsheba certainly is a, a fine woman, and I would like to meet a woman and have a relationship with, you know, with her, like Uriah has with Bathsheba, but that wasn't the case. David said, I want Bathsheba. And that's where the covetedness comes in, because then he began to scheme, and he found a sneaky and sinful way to make Bathsheba his wife. So the commandment not to covet essentially says, don't go there, don't even think about it, watch your heart, don't let those thoughts come into your, your mind or your heart so that you don't begin to scheme. It's disrespectful to your neighbor, it's harmful to your neighbor, it's harmful to yourself. No good can come from it. So that's one level. There's another level too. Remember, the commandments all refer to loving the Lord our God with all our mind, all our strength, everything we got, and love our neighbors ourselves. Well, what has this got to do with loving the Lord our God? Well, first of all, who is the one who created our neighbor? And who is the one who created us? That is the one true God. And God created me with certain gifts and talents and strengths, and God has allowed me in my life to uh, have certain things. And my God has also created my neighbor and allowed him or her to uh, achieve the things that uh, 
our neighbor has, my neighbor has. So if I say, I don't want what I have, I want what my neighbor has, what I'm saying is, God didn't make me good enough. I am not good enough. I want to be someone else. I want someone else's station in life. I want to be more like them. And I denigrate my own self because of I comp I'm comparing myself to my neighbor. And as the kid's expression goes, God didn't create no junk. The important thing for me is to live fully to, for who I am, not for what my neighbor is, and to want and have the things that God, I have in my life, not the things my neighbor has in my neighbor's life. Now, it's one thing for me to say, well, God is maybe who I am, and I want to learn more. I want to go to college or learn a skill. I want to improve myself. I want to, you know, diet and lose some weight so I look better and, and I, you know, do things better. That's different because what I'm doing is I'm taking the essential ingredients of who I am that God has made me to be and I'm working with them to fulfill myself or to be more fulfilled. In the same way, it would be... Um, Good for me to say, you know, I would like to get a new car because this one's kind of old and junky. And so I'm going to work hard, save my money or, you know, whatever it is. I'm, or I'd like to get a new house, a better house than the one I have, maybe in a better neighborhood or something with more room or something like that. It's one thing to do that, to set those goals personally and in possession, uh, in our possessions and work towards them. It's quite another thing to say, I want what they have. That's different. So part of it is recognizing who I am as, as a person of God and, and becoming fulfilled with, with who I am in God. So what we find is that coveting is really a fascinating and multi-layered uh, sin. We aren't to go there um, in our minds, we aren't to, to uh, let evil thoughts arise in us. We're to be happy with who we are uh, as we are created by God. I hope that this has been helpful for you. I hope that you will now have a better understanding of coveting, which is all over our culture, by the way, and be therefore in a better position to avoid it in your own life. I'm Pastor Rob Blessard, and I'm signing off for the summer. Again, please let me know if you have any thoughts or concerns or, or suggestions for how we can do Food for the Journey better when we resume in the fall. Thank you and God bless.